Bienvenue tout le monde. Welcome everybody. Uh, I hope everyone is well. Delighted to see so many attendees uh, hopping on the line. This is wonderful. Um, as many of you uh, might know, the ISSP has a wonderful partnership with the Royal Canadian Institute for Science. And twice a year, we organize public panels with the RCIS on key topics of the day uh, of, with an interest for science, society, and policy. So welcome to this session today, uh, which focuses on the mind-brain relationship and addictions. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather, or I should say the land on which the University of Ottawa is situated, and where I am gathering here at my home office, uh, is situated on the unceded territory out of the Algonquin people. The partnership with the Royal Canadian Institute uh, for Science is uh, in its third year, I believe, uh, now, and I'm delighted to have with us as well uh, Hella Tosina. You can see her hopefully on your uh, on your screens, uh, who's a former president of the RCIS. We collaborate together on this series, our two institutions. And we put on two panels per year on science, society, policy uh, salient topics. This panel, as some of you might know, certainly our panelists know, was supposed to be held last spring. Uh, but as a result of COVID, we canceled uh, the panel. It was intended at that time to be an in-person panel. So this is the first time the RCIS and the ISSP are hosting a virtual uh, panel in their panel series, and we're absolutely delighted uh, to be able to do that. We have a wonderful group of speakers today. I won't be uh, introducing them. Our moderator will be introducing them. My opening remarks here will be very, very brief, so we can get right into the panel. Uh, I did just want to say a very few uh, words about the Institute for Science, Society, and Policy. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the Institute, uh, we're a cross-faculty research institute at the University of Ottawa. Um, our work focuses on the interface between science, society, and policy. And there are three key areas that uh, animate our work. Uh, science for policy, otherwise known as evidence-based or evidence-informed decision-making. Policies for science, technology, and innovation is the second thematic area. And the third thematic area is governance of emerging technologies. We have multiple research uh, um, members across the university uh, and beyond and a vari large variety of, of senior fellows and other members of our network who explore these issues across just about any domain that you can think of uh, from energy to genomics to synthetic biology, uh, you name it, autonomous uh, mobility, uh, we uh, really bring together a wide variety of expertise. But really what brings all of these uh, people together is their interest in aligning science, society, and policy imperatives to tackle the grand challenges of our time. The challenge before us today uh, is uh, the topic of addictions. And we've got a tremendous panel to, uh, to take this on. Uh, we have an absolutely outstanding moderator uh, for today, Ursula Gobel, who many of you probably know. Uh, Ursula is Vice President of Stakeholder Engagement uh, and Advancement of Society at the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, where her role is to provide strategic leadership to advance and mobilize social sciences and humanities research. So I can't think of a better illustration of, of the work that you do, Ursula, than at moderating this panel today, because this is very much about uh, mobilizing social sciences and, and humanities uh, research. Uh, just a couple of uh, administrative notes before we get started, and I'll pass it to, to Ursula. Uh, so what we have done in terms of the question and answer portion of the session is that the chat uh, has been disabled but we would like you to use the Q&A function. So at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to bring up a series of, of uh, options. One of them is Q&A. So if you have a question, 
feel free to just type it in at, even as the presenters are, are presenting and as Ursula gets to the Q&A portion, the discussion portion of the panel, she'll be, uh, she'll be drawing on, on those. Um, and our panel will conclude with some words uh, from Hella Tosina uh, from the Royal Canadian Institute uh, for Science. So, without further ado, uh, la seule autre chose que j'aimerais mentionner, uh, c'est si jamais vous avez des questions, vous voulez poser des questions en français, n'hésitez surtout pas uh, d'écrire vos questions en français, puis uh, les panélistes et uh, notre ami animatrice uh, vont certainement faire dans, le, de, leur, dans leur mesure de possible de répondre à, à vos questions. Plusieurs de nos panélistes sont uh, bilingues. Alors, Ursula? Without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Monica. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm absolutely delighted and honored to have been invited to moderate this very, very interesting discussion that really brings together the multidisciplinary approaches, perspectives, insights on addressing the questions on addiction, and particularly the mind-brain connection. So uh, we have three panelists uh, who I'm delighted to introduce, Andrew Smith, a full professor at the School of Psychology at the University of Ottawa. Uh, Patrick Fafal, a full professor and graduate at, graduate at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa and Associate Director of the Global Strategy Lab. And Dr. Matthew Young uh, is a Senior Research and Policy Analyst at the Canadian Centre on Substance Abuse and Addiction, the CCSA, and an adjunct research professor of psychology at Carleton University. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. So our uh, session today uh, will have approximately eight minutes of presentations by each of our panelists and then we will have a moderated uh, session of questions and answers and commentary uh, for about 40 minutes. Uh, so without further ado as well, I'd like to invite Andrea, Andrea Smith, our first presenter, uh, to share her remarks. Andra, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Can I just confirm that everything is working? You can see my slides and hear me. Uh, yeah, now we can. Now you can. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> So um, thank you very much for having me. I think this is a really important issue and I'm happy to, uh, to discuss it um, with you, particularly the brain part. So I really believe that knowledge is power and that if we can understand why something is happening, then we have a better chance of changing it. And I think that really pertains to addiction as well. So our brains control everything we do, both the good and the bad. And it's also hardwired to respond to pleasure. So it's really a, quite a brilliant design by nature that ensures that we'll repeat behaviors that are indispensable for survival. We'll go through the necessary steps to procure the food, say, that's necessary for us to survive because there's a link between food and pleasure. So just imagine your favorite dessert has just been put in front of you and you smell it and you look at it and finally you get to take a bite and it just, it's a great feeling. Well, that's your brain saying, this is delicious. And what's happening is a chemical like dopamine is being released in your reward pathways in the brain. And it's making a mental note saying, yes, I would like to do that again. And nature truly is incredible. The behaviors that are pleasurable release dopamine. So from an evolutionary perspective, the brain can be broken down into three separate parts. The reptilian or early brain at the back that has, uh, takes over our breathing and swallowing, things that we don't really think about. Then on top of that, we have the more mammalian brain with more advanced abilities like emotion and reward. This is the part that helps with survival. It gives us our fight or flight response uh, so that we run if we see a bear. It makes, our, it makes sure our essential needs are met by making behaviors like eating rewarding. It controls and regulates our ability to feel pleasure. And by feeling that pleasure, it motivates us 
to repeat the behavior. So these two parts that I just mentioned are kind of like our, our older brain. All animals have these parts of the brain. What sets us apart from other animals is the fact that on top of this older brain, in addition, we have a new brain. And so more specifically, the prefrontal cortex. And this is the part of the brain above our eyes that helps us to make decisions, helps us to plan and organize ourselves, set goals and, and do what it takes to accomplish the goals without getting distracted. So our higher order executive functioning. So this part of our brain is really the, the CEO of the brain, the orchestra leader. This is the part of the brain that isn't fully developed until about the early 20s. So when deciding on the, the legal age for legalization of non-medicinal cannabis, this was uh, a topic uh, in the news. And this is the brain part that they were talking about. So the brain develops from the back to the front in humans. And the reward part of the brain, so here let's refer to that as a striatum. It's responsible for motivation, for reward, and it's developed already in adolescence. So our brain is ready for reward but our prefrontal cortex has a slower trajectory and it's not ready yet to help with that sort of cognitive control. And so what that means is that emotional reactivity and that search for reward outpaces cognitive control. And this is why teens are a bit more prone to making high risk choices, sort of taking that immediate reward uh, without thinking about the long-term consequences. And this is also why youth are more susceptible to addiction. And drugs of abuse tap into this same brain circuitry, responsible for that release of dopamine. And it doesn't distinguish between, say, that chocolate cake you were thinking about at the beginning or a ding on your phone saying that someone's liked your Facebook post. Or for that matter, it doesn't distinguish between legal or illegal drugs. What really distinguishes it is our prefrontal cortex, so that newer brain. That's what lets us know good reward from bad. And so we really need our new brain to be online to make good decisions and lead successful lives, especially because everything in our modern world seems to be designed to tap into this reward network. And marketing companies, they know about this reward pathway and how it works. They know that our brains are designed to get hooked. The old brain works with reward-based learning. You have a trigger, so you have a bad day, you have something happen to you, you're bored, whatever it is. You reach for that chocolate cake and you get that dopamine increase. And so then you want to repeat that. And this is how addictions occur. So the definition of addiction being that it's a repetition of behavior despite negative consequences. So clearly drugs of abuse like cocaine, cannabis, alcohol, opiates, they work exactly the same way as that chocolate cake, but the amount of dopamine released is far, far greater than any natural reward. And because of that, the drug can truly hijack the brain. It turns off that new prefrontal cortex and leaves you in that old reward system. So judgment becomes distorted and the brain starts to treat the substance itself as necessary for survival. It's not a failure of moral judgment or poor willpower. It's not that the brain truly is hijacked. And the more you use, the less dopamine receptors are present. So you need to take more and eventually there isn't enough dopamine and then eventually nothing feels good. But why do some people get addicted and other people don't? Well, there's always going to be a genetic component. And so it's suggested that about 50% is genetic. That leaves a lot of other things there. So we're talking about things like developmental trajectory. And I, I mentioned that the risk is higher for adolescents. Uh, environmental factors. So just having access to drugs is going to, to play a role. Socioeconomic status is also going to, to be a, a factor. One of the biggest factors is actually stress. So stress is a huge disruptor of positive, healthy brain development. 
If you don't have enough food or access to clean water or you've experienced early childhood traumas, the brain is in a stressed state and there's no passage of information to and from the prefrontal cortex. So this interferes with all those advantages of having the developed prefrontal cortex. It goes offline uh, often when you need it the most in those stressful times. So then if drugs of abuse are introduced, as they often are, unfortunately, to calm or ease situations, that sets us up living in that middle brain, kind of in survival mode. So I'm a brain imager and I've studied young people's brains who've been using cannabis. And our studies have shown that these young, young adults, they have to uh, engage their brain uh, with more effort. They have to use more brain energy to perform executive functioning tasks more than the non-users, suggesting that they, they have to compensate for some underlying deficits. And so we just see this particularly in regions related to decision-making, memory, impulse control, and emotion regulation. So the drug use has really negatively impacted that prefrontal cortex and those higher order cognitive processes that are required for academic employment relationships, success, all those things that we need to lead enriched successful lives. But there's hope. <laughs> um, it's, uh, there is hope. We do need, our old and our new brains. And we need them to work together in harmony. And that's one of the great things about our brain also is that we do have a dynamic and a malleable brain. It can change. So yes, stress, drug use can negatively impact our, our brain function, but it doesn't have to define the rest of our life. If we can engage that prefrontal cortex, if we could stop the drug use, we can change our brain for good. Our brains are always changing in response to our behaviors, our thoughts, everything that we go through. And if we can create good habits that enhance that motivation for other non-drug behaviors, so naturally rewarding behaviors, then we can strengthen that prefrontal cortex and those circuits and retrain our brain. So just doing something over and over again creates brain connections and, and eventually those connections will work faster and more efficiently so the habits will get easier. And we know that things like mindfulness, like being in nature, exercise, nutrition, good sleep patterns, social connectedness, having a purpose, gratitude, creativity, all of these things could really strengthen that mental muscle uh, that we call our brain that to me creates our mind to give us power over that middle or that old brain and, and really allows us to have a healthy brain to help us get through tough times. And the healthy brain is a happy brain. So thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. Fascinating, fascinating um, uh, perspectives of, of, from neuroscience and a number of uh, uh, comments um, have come through in terms of uh, that we can address in our discussion later in terms of questions just to unpack some of those key points that you had made. But I think we'll next turn it to Matthew, um, who will bring the perspectives of addiction and its impacts on society. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me and see my screen? Yes, Wonderful. perfectly. Thank you. So, um, yes, thank you, Andra, and, and thank you so much to the organizers. I, I, it's a really honor to be here and to speak to you. I'm going to switch gears a little bit now and talk a little bit about the so, uh, societal impacts of substance use. So, like Andra said, um, you know, we try and it's interesting kind of it made me think like uh, some people who have been around for a while may uh, know us as the uh, Canadian in, uh, Canadian Center on Substance Abuse. We used to be called that. We changed our name recently out of recognition that addiction is not a moral failing. Uh, it's a health issue. And we do need to uh, give uh, people uh, credit. And abuse can be stigmatizing, the term abuse, because it, it, uh, it implies that somebody is making uh, poor decisions 
and that they are responsible and can be stigmatizing. So quite, uh, but, but a year or so ago, I uh, know maybe two years now, we changed our name and now we're the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction. We were created uh, by an act of parliament to provide evidence-based information uh, to the Parliament of Canada. Um, I'm going to take us through a couple of di two different projects quickly that look at the societal impacts of substance use. Um, and the first one I'm going to talk about is, uh, looking the, is a, a study that we did, uh, a large comprehensive study examining the, uh, the impact of substance use on the Canadian economy or the costs and harms associated with substance use. So this was published back in July, and uh, we looked at, uh, at, at, the, at substance use over a, a large period of time. Um, this is, these are our, uh, the, the partners working on it. We work very closely with a large team of people, um, including uh, folks from the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction, as well as from the Canadian Institute for Substance Use Research at the University of Victoria. To conduct this study, we used some uh, validated methods that are used by the Global Burden of Disease Group um, and, uh, and other, and other uh, methods used by the World Health Organization and calculated the costs and harms associated with uh, different substances. Namely, uh, we looked at alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, cocaine, opioids, other CNS depressants, other CNS stimulants, and then a group that was referred to kind of as all other drugs. And in order to calculate these costs, we looked across four different domains. We looked at what are the healthcare related costs. So this included the number of hospitalizations uh, for people uh, who are uh, hospitalized for fully attributable conditions like uh, an opioid poisoning or a partially attributable condition, which might include a, uh, a cancer that would be considered caused by alcohol. I'd be more than happy to go into details of the methods that we used, uh, but uh, we, I, I don't want to really kind of get, uh, get stuck in that right now, but I could talk about it anybody who's interested in learning later on. We also looked at lost productivity costs, and this included both uh, time absent from the workplace due to short and long-term disability, as well as the uh, absenteeism from the workplace due to premature mortality cause uh, attributable to substance use. We also looked at uh, criminal justice costs, which included costs associated with the policing, uh, incarceration and court costs associated with substance use attributable crimes, and then looked at other direct costs. So it's, it's a pretty, I guess what I'm just trying to say is that this is a really good general overview of the impact of substance use on Canadian society. So what did we find? Well, um, some people find this surprising, maybe many of you will not, but the greatest impact uh, on Canadian society comes from alcohol and tobacco, uh, with even more from alcohol. Canadi uh, substance use costs uh, the Canadian economy, at least in 2017, it cost the Canadian economy $46 billion, or about $1,258 for every man, woman, and child in Canada. And the legally available substances accounted for almost 63% of these costs. Uh, tobacco leads in the number of deaths, um, which is not surprising, but it is interesting if we look at the number of potential years of productive life lost, which uh, we find that a tobacco decreases because the average age of death of somebody with a tobacco attributable condition is much older and so it doesn't take as many, it doesn't remove as many people uh, from the workforce. Um, we do find that alcohol still leads uh, with opioids coming in um, second. And uh, we do see a sudden increase in years of productive, potential years of productive life loss uh, over the years 2015 to 2017. This represents our, our current, uh, the opioid crisis that uh, we're currently experiencing. Stimulants costs are, are increasing. We do, uh, we do note that the per person costs associated with uh, substance use, uh, we see stimulant costs uh, are increasing. Um, and this has been noted uh, anecdotally by a lot of our partners across the country with a rise in methamphetamine use uh, and, uh, and cocaine use. Uh, when it comes to criminal justice, the criminal justice system, 
Uh, we do note that alcohol and cocaine are responsible for the greatest costs of the criminal justice system. Uh, in fact, some of the research we did to develop uh, these cost estimates, we found that uh, uh, that 20% 20, 20 of violent crime would not have occurred if an individual had not been either intoxicated uh, by alcohol or seeking alcohol. Uh, when it comes to criminal justice costs, we found that in 2017, almost half of cannabis related crimes were a direct result of its illegality. So we do find that, the, that, uh, that these are mainly violations of the Canadian uh, Drugs and Substances Act. So, this gives you a bit of a snapshot, and I don't want to take all the time to doing this, about what the costs are to Canadian society. Um, I would point you to, we do have an online data visualization tool. The results of this study uh, were really uh, vast, and you can see how, how granular it can get. We have it by province, by cost category, by, uh, uh, by sex, by year. And if you are interested in looking a little bit closer, you can go on to our data visualization tool. I'd like to switch gears a little bit to now talk a little bit about, um, about another group, another project that we lead at the CCSA. This is called the Canadian Community Epidemiology Network on Drug Use. Um, this is where, like a sentinel surveillance system that, uh, that highlights or alerts Canadians to drug-related health threats and issues of immediate concern. Um, we were, uh, in, in 2013, uh, the Sendu Network was one of the first to release a, a bulletin or an alert on the presence of illicit fentanyl in the illegal drug supply. Um, so I'd just like to highlight for the point of discussion later on, um, back in April, we released a, a bulletin that talked about adulterants, contaminants and co-occurring substances in drugs on the illegal market in Canada. One of the things that I think is really important and may, may, maybe we could, it may form part of the discussion later on is really uh, this first line from this bulletin. The inherent risks of substance use are significantly increased for drugs procured on the illegal market as there is no quality control and the drug contents are unpredictable. One of the things that we, we've heard over and over again and we do see in some of the, uh, in some of the epidemiological data is that you know, when, when uh, OxyContin was being uh, diverted onto the illicit drug market, um, there were increases in overdoses and increases in poisonings, most definitely. It was, but it was really when uh, those the uh, OxyContin was removed from the market that we saw uh, we saw overdoses and poisoning spike. And the question is, is is why? And one of the reasons was is that when there was there was less uh, pharmaceutically uh, developed OxyContin on the market when it, when that decreased, the demand did not decrease. An organized crime stepped in with fentanyl, carfentanyl, and all kinds of other contaminants. These are, I'm going to show you two infographics that come from some of the groups that we work with that do drug checking. Drug checking is an intervention, a harm reduction intervention, where people who are going to do uh, illegal drugs can have their drugs tested uh, in a harm reduction center. And these are the kinds of of drugs that have been found in people who have purchased and are expected to use opioids. And you can see just, I'm not gonna read them all out, but there's just a laundry list of, of contaminants within these drugs. This is the uh, same with stimulants. And then finally, I'm just going to mention um, what the impact that, uh, that COVID-19 uh, has had on the illegal drug supply and uh, people who use drugs. Um, one of the things that we noted immediately early on um, after the, the pandemic began was that uh, there were changes um, related to COVID-19 in the illegal drug supply. And so the key message from this really is that uh, disruptions to an already unpredictable illegal drug market coupled with reduced access to direct services, these are like treatment, harm reduction, uh, other medical services, could pose significant health risks to people who use substances. And, you know, sure enough, uh, since, uh, since we've released this alert, we have seen uh, British Columbia reported 645 illicit drug toxicity deaths. It's doubled the number at the same time frame in 2019. Uh, we've seen the same thing in Toronto uh, and we've, we, we, we see it across the board, harms associated with substance use are increasing. 
Um, finally, some, some possible response options that have been included in, in our bulletins before is uh, increasing access to virtual care, other treatment options uh, like direct, uh, direct services. We also talk about that, that the, the possibility of access to a more reliable and safer drug supply um, and access to harm reduction tools and services. So with that, um, I will uh, hopefully that whet your appetite for more discussion. And uh, I have a lot more information where this could come from. And if you're interested, uh, feel free to, uh, to chat about it later or reach out to me after, uh, after the, uh, the session is over. I'd be happy to chat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. And uh, again, just a reminder to everyone and to encourage you to pose any questions that you may have for our panelists or comments that could stimulate further discussion among our panelists in our Q&A box. I haven't seen any questions yet, so I'm sure everyone's thinking about them, but please feel free to post them as they go along. And so we've had two panelists um, already illustrate the complexity um, of, of substance use disorder uh, and, and how it is very much a pressing and complex issue. Andrea certainly uh, explored uh, how the brain pathways uh, of reward reinforcement um, work on that mind-brain connection. And Matthew highlighted, and certainly from a cost perspective, but the impacts on Canadian society. And so we're delighted now to invite Patrick Fafal to uh, also bring in perspectives on policy issues and policy development. Patrick? Thank you very much. I want to thank um, the Institute for Science and Society and Policy and the RSCI for inviting me to this panel. Um, my job is to sort of bring a more policy perspective to the material that you've just seen. And I guess the way I would introduce it is by saying that what we've just heard underscores the complexity of addictions, given the multifaceted nature of it, but also the potential, it would be reasonable for someone to say that the policy mix that we see in Canada, and indeed in most countries, is almost irrational. That is to say, why is it that the way we regulate um, and uh, think of policy for addictive substances, and I'll use that phrase, is so vastly different. So when we talk about the economic impacts of different addictive substances, uh, that is simply there, but we know that the divide between legal and illegal changes, we know that the amount of effort and time we spend is very much incommensurate. So let me offer some concrete examples of that. So Matthew, at the end of his presentation, talked about the critical importance of safe supply. That is to say, uh, we know that the drugs that addicts consume, particularly if they're addicted to opioids, are often contaminated and it's often the contaminants uh, that are the most dangerous. It is relatively straightforward to imagine how safe supply might look, but from a policy and program perspective, it's very complicated. So we need to figure out why. What is it about the, the challenge that makes it so hard? Similarly, um, presented some data on tobacco so we know that the cost, the economic costs of tobacco and tobacco related disease are enormous, but we have a great deal of difficulty uh, getting tobacco use down below about 15%. It's kind of stuck there, um, although it's, uh, the story is a bit better among youth. But the reason it's a bit better among youth is because young people have taken up vaping. How we frame that solution, electronic cigarettes, has an enormous impact on what the policy mix looks like. And so that's, let me use those two examples to make a couple of points about the policy process. So the first is policy making is path dependent. We do today what we did yesterday. And so making change in policy is very difficult. And so in many of these areas like illegal drugs, um, what we do is, is a function of uh, a series of decisions made over many years. And in the case of illegal drugs, rendered more complicated by the fact that Canada is a signatory to various international treaties, which create obligations to treat different substances in very particular ways. Second, policy is messy in the sense that different orders of government play a role. So it's one thing to, uh, for the government of Canada to do as it has done and embrace harm reduction 
for drugs generally or push for the legalization of cannabis. It's quite another to know whether and to what extent provincial governments are on board. And we know in the case of safe supply of drugs that the federal and provincial governments don't always agree on the appropriate response. Um, I guess finally, the most important thing is policy is the result of many things of which the evidence that you've he heard here today is but one input. And so when we try and ask, explain what it is that governments do, we have to take into account not just the evidence that shows, for example, that vaping is much less harmful uh, than uh, combustible cigarettes, although that there's a bit of a debate there, but nevertheless, it seems pretty clear that what is harmful of tobacco is the noxious substances in the cigarette, less, less, much less so than nicotine, although nicotine is itself an issue. And governments make choices about uh, which parts to, to, to tackle, but they do so mindful of social norms, economic considerations, and a variety of other things that are, go above and beyond the science, which sometimes leads to situations where governments make choices that, again, on the face of it, seem somewhat irrational. So let me use the two examples. In the case of harm reduction, while there's an enormous body of evidence that can show that harm reduction approaches, whether it be for tobacco or alcohol or opioids, uh, can make a big difference, and Matthew Young mentioned a few of them, we know that in some jurisdictions, people are very resistant uh, and governments are very resistant to embracing them. Well, partly it's because if a drug is illegal, we are faced with a bit of a paradox. How do we explain to the public that as a government, it is in the best interest of everyone to actually facilitate and enable people to, to do that, that which they're going to do in the safest manner possible, even if it is illegal? This takes a bit of explaining, this takes a bit of reasoning and is politically hard to do. Not impossible, as various jurisdictions have demonstrated, but complicated. Um, to use the example of um, vaping, same kind of thing. So that we have created in our society a, a very strong debate in several countries. But what we observe is that in different countries, the regulations or the regulatory approach to vaping is vastly different. In some countries in Asia, vaping is considered a poison. Electronic cigarettes are banned. In Australia, for example, electronic cigarettes are just not available legally. Whereas in other countries like the United Kingdom, they're integrated into a harm reduction approach and are made widely available. Canada is somewhere in between. This suggests that what's going on is much, much more than simply an accumulation of evidence that shows either, as Andrew Smith's presentation pointed out, the, the basic physiology of addictions, or if you have an economic study, as we just saw, the differential costs, that though, while those, those inputs are important, we have to, to understand why governments make the choices they make, we need to understand, in some cases, local context. All of which to say that policymaking in this, in this space of addictions is incredibly complicated, incredibly difficult, and change does happen, as we've seen, but it's not going to be a linear direct process as we might wish, but rather it's going to be the subject of push and pull as between governments, different parts of governments, different orders of government. Eventually we'll get where we wanna go, but it's by no means a straightforward process. So I'll stop there and we can pick up the conversation in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Patrick. Yes, indeed, policymaking is not a linear process uh, and very, very complex, but uh, I will invite our, our our uh, panelists, Matthew and Andrew, to rejoin us uh, on the screen. And thank you all uh, also re for respecting your time uh, in terms of the presentations. Always difficult uh, for any scientist or scholar to pack that into seven minutes or eight minutes, but it was an excellent, excellent work and certainly enough to start our conversation going. And again, encore, vous pouvez vous poser vos questions en français. Uh, or in English, and please feel free to share those comments or questions in our Q&A box. And so among our panelists, we've explored the relationship uh, between the mind and the brain and addiction. We've explored uh, societal implications, and we've uh, looked at what evidence has to say about policy uh, relating to addressing addictions. And so a, a few questions, maybe just to go back to each of our panelists, uh, relevant to their presentations. And then I'll also encourage uh, all of our panelists to, to, uh, to 
comment uh, amongst themselves as well. Uh, I don't need to direct traffic too much in a linear fashion. So if you have also comments or, or questions for each other uh, based on what is shared, please feel free to do so. Uh, so maybe we'll start with, with Andra uh, as you began our session today. Uh, so uh, you, you spoke about um, uh, certain neuroplasticity, uh, some of the mechanism, if you will, to, uh, to stop addictive behavior or stop using drugs, but that's not that easy. So uh, you mentioned briefly mindfulness. So how could something like mindfulness training uh, be helpful? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Yeah, it's, I did make it sound easy and it's not easy. Our brain really is designed to live in that, that middle emotional brain and to keep us alive and safe. We have, you know, this thing called the negativity bias where, where negative things really grab our attention more than positive things. And so that's really, that makes changing our behaviors and thought patterns really hard. And that's why recovery from substance problems it, it is difficult because you have to overwrite those older patterns. So mindfulness, so it seems it's kind of like a buzzword these days, it really teaches us to uh, attend to the moment, to be present and fully engaged with whatever you're doing at the moment, not judgmentally and, and not avoiding it. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of on you know, like a remote control, you're on play, you're not rewinding, think about the past, you're not thinking about fast forwarding to the future and it really trains our attention networks and it helps us to to respond in a situation rather than react and mm -hmm. and and so I think it takes us out of that middle brain because it's engaging our prefrontal cortex and in fact mindfulness it 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 um it trains the prefrontal cortex it actually activates the prefrontal cortex and so people sometimes think about meditation that it calms your brain it doesn't actually it actually increases activity in your brain and and strengthens those connections to allow that prefrontal cortex to uh to guide your mm -hmm. behavior rather than living in that middle middle brain so just a, a quick follow-up question. So uh, it, in the context of stress, and you mentioned stress is, is a huge factor uh, and mindfulness, uh, and, you, and you're right, we often hear the term mindfulness as a buzzword and you're in a meditative state and so your environment is very peaceful and calm and you really move into that state where how does the role of stress uh, affect your ability even to adopt those behaviors because stressful moments come at any time. Mm -hmm. So repetition, repetition, repetition. You train, mm -hmm. you train, you train to get those pathways so that it's almost automatic that you can, you can step into the moment, even if it's in chaos, you can be in that moment. Um, but certainly things like adverse childhood experiences that again, put you in that middle brain and, and make, uh, children certainly more vulnerable to uh, to um, mm -hmm. pro problems with mental health as well as with addiction. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, their 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 fundamental levels of physiological needs and safety needs are are far different from somebody that doesn't have those childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. And so again, uh, uh, you know, if you can those things that we know make a healthy brain. We know the things that make a healthy brain. We just need to have access to them and be aware of them. And uh, I think mm -hmm. that sort of speaks also to our policy and, and what's, mm -hmm. you know, what's really important for society, uh, you know, putting a lot more focus into the treatment of, of this sort of issue. And, and that the truth is, is that somebody who has gone through adverse childhood experiences and has a substance use disorder, they're not going to overcome that substance use disorder unless their ACEs are addressed and they can mm. deal with those ACEs, then they can move on beyond the, the, the substance use disorder. Thank you. And, and we'll certainly- Could I add on. something to that? Yes. Oh, I'll sorry. No, yeah. I mean, one of the, one of my, uh, one, a quote that I really uh, liked, I don't really know much of the comedian's other work, but is uh, uh, the, the comedian Russell Brands once said, uh, I never had a, he had a, he had an ad addiction one time. He said, I didn't, I never had a drug problem. I had a reality problem. Drugs were my solution. And I think that that kind of sums up a lot of what we were talking about. 
And, and one of the things to, to, if I can piggyback a bit on what Andrew was saying, is that one of the, because, because craving is an essential part of drug addiction, uh, we, it, it, it hijacks that middle brain and we just react by, by engaging in that behavior or that kind of, or, or drug taking or chocolate cake eating or whatever. And what mindfulness can do is it can give you the space to be able to notice the craving before you've actually just entered into the act of, 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 of acting on the craving. And so it can give you that, it gives you that space mentally to be able to stretch out that and to be able to then be mindful about, do I, do I follow that? Uh, do I follow my craving or do I work through it, understand that it's impermanent and that, that it will pass and then work through it that way. So I think that that's, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I, 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 I I know Andrew and I haven't talked about the mindfulness part of it, though, but I'm really, I'm, even though I do more of the epidemiology stuff, I'm fascinated by that part of, 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 how, uh, of how that can be helpful for people who, right. who, who may have drug uh, problems. Patrick, you wanted to weigh in as well? So I want to just do a bit of a, play this out. So let's assume that we could come to a very robust agreement that this thing, something called mindfulness would be useful. Let's further assume that we thought it was useful and we wanted to take aggressive action to address the level of addictions to various things. So the question would be, well, why don't we just do it? Well, there's a couple of things about healthcare in this country that we have to, be, we have to always keep in mind. We, we talk about the fact that we have a publicly funded healthcare system, and by and large we do, but we're very strict about what's in and what's out. So if you're talking about a hospital service or a doctor service, straightforward. But mindfulness doesn't actually lend itself to those categories. Uh, it might be, depending on how you want to think of it, a mental health service. Well, in this country, we fund some mental health services through our taxes and others we pay through our ins private insurance or out of pocket. So the Medicare bargain, if you will, is incomplete so that we have things that could be useful that are not funded. And once that happens, we know that it gets way more, it's much more difficult to get to where we wanna go because we have to find ways of coming up with the money to pay for those services. So even when we recognize that something is useful, actually organizing ourselves as a society to go and get it and go and do it, turns out to be more complicated because of decisions we made 40, 50, 60 years ago on how we wanna structure healthcare. Right, definitely, um, definitely a factor and very much uh, also an individual factor, right? Uh, it, if you look at societal, you look at policy, uh, you look at law, uh, but the very factor of recognizing that one is vulnerable to being hijacked, using that term, uh, is, is a really first step, right? Because it's that self-acknowledgement um, of that vulnerability of, that may trigger uh, that brain to take over. Um, so a question from Michael, uh, for, sorry, for Michael, for Matthew, uh, with regards, your presentation highlighted the importance to distinguish substances, uh, alcohol, tobacco, stimulants, emerging substances, when, when we're assessing their respective impacts uh, on costs and on society, healthcare, loss, productivity, et cetera. So what would you consider some of the barriers or impediments to developing solutions that could include policy. So I guess this is a question also uh, for everyone to address each substance, but at the same time, ensure that we have a coordinated comprehensive approach. Matthew? That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's, it's, it's useful to point out. So I, uh, so my background, I originally looked at, uh, at studied gambling and uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, an impetitive or problematic behavior. Then I moved into um, you know, illegal substances and then I've been working more on, on alcohol and, uh, and other, the legal substances. And it's interesting, you know, this is something that probably Patrick would have thought a lot about, but as you move through them, like, you know, when we talk about harm reduction, that only applies to legal dr illegal drugs. We talk about responsible drinking and harm reduction and responsible gambling and harm reduction for other kinds of drugs. So there's a value system that we place on, on, these, on these kinds of drugs, even though somebody who uses alcohol to escape their negative reality is no more morally bankrupt or morally upstanding than an individual who uses 
opioids to 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 escape their uh, intolerable reality. So we, we've we've at some point along the way placed a judgment on them, and that judgment uh, has, has appears in law. And that and that one of the things that I think I illustrated with some of the Sendu bulletins is that that value judgment has a cost to it in terms of harming those people even more than they would otherwise be harmed were it not illegal. Now, I, I, I'm not getting to get into the space where I think, you know, where we where we really talk about we should just make an open market of, of all drugs into like the, the, the shopper's drug market. You should be able to go in and buy this, that and the other thing. I, what I am saying, though, is that when we do develop our, our, our policies, we need to be mindful that we don't create more harm uh, than we than we than, than we than we solve or that we reduce. And one of the things that I we saw as we charted the opioid uh, epidemic as it moved is that we did see quite clearly that there were massive amounts of of oxycontin getting diverted into the illegal market, and then we saw a, a large, like I said in my presentation, a large amount of uh, a, a big policy push to reduce the supply, but we didn't have commensurate decrease in demand, and that created a really problematic environment where we we saw all of this fentanyl, car fentanyl and everything uh, flow into the market. So it is a challenge for policymakers in this environment to come up with what is the what is the right approach to to reducing the amount of harm. And that's going to be different in the illegal market like opioids and and, and, and methamphetamine than it is in the legal market, which is um, it, like alcohol. So we have seen alcohol costs and harms increase over time. And why is that? Well, we also see policies relaxing across the many provinces in Canada, alcohol being sold um, in more places, greater hours. Um, we, we, and even though it is probably, it is the drug, single drug that costs the Canadian economy the most, and it's also more responsible for the greatest deal of healthcare expenses um, to anybody. So maybe I'll, I think I, answer, I hopefully answered part of your question, but I, I won't yeah, continue. Yeah, yeah. On, uh, again, I'll, uh, yeah, again, a complex issue. Patrick, did you want to add anything to that? Only to say that um, when we say something is made more complicated because of the legal regime, that's almost certainly true. And it's even more egregious in the United States because the not only are some substances illegal, but the way in which the law is applied in the United States and in other, several other countries is very, very, very aggressive. And so it creates a huge social dislocation. And so one, what's nice about Matthew's work is that if you think of it holistically uh, and think of all the costs, that at least you have the potential to ask good questions about, you know, what is the, the cost benefit of the, of the policy mix we've chosen. But make no mistake, Getting off the path we're on is very hard. It's not impossible. We did legalize cannabis after all, much to the surprise of many, but it is not by any means simple. And sometimes it can take a couple of generations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so while we've got you on the screen, um, a question for you. So um, what is government regulation of addictive substances? Why uh, is government regulation of addictive substances not based simply on the relative risk to human health? So an important question. And we haven't talked very much so far in this panel about risk and risk assessment, but um, in a perfect world, we would take the kind of data that Matthew has come up with and we would ask, uh, what is the likelihood that addiction to certain substances would cause harms? And we would, we would calculate the greatest costs. And so our touchstone would be something that is data-driven and empirical on in terms of the costs and risks to both people and to society. But that's not at all the way we make policy typically. So to go back to the example of vaping, while nicotine addiction is a problem in of itself, the health risks associated with nicotine are less than the health risks associated with all the other substances that are in combustible tobacco. But that's not the way we regulate. We treat vaping products and combustible cigarettes in this same category. So we make we have no systematic way of taking into account the risks. And we sure as heck don't do that as between addictive substances. And so we're, in that sense, it's, it's irrational, but there's some very simple explanations as to why that is. Uh, it has things to do like, like economics. 
there's a lot of money to be made in tobacco and now in electronic cigarettes. Uh, and governments are scrambling to try and manage both the legal and illegal distribution of these things. Same thing with, uh, obviously, with illegal substances. And so I think it's important for uh, scholars and others to draw attention to, to relative risk and, and underscore the irrationality sometimes of the policy. Um, but that's, that's a necessary, but by no means a sufficient condition to getting the kind of change that we probably need. Thank you. Um, Andrea, we, we were talking about socioeconomic factors. Uh, in terms, are there, in your presentation, uh, you certainly spoke about the adverse childhood experiences and how adverse childhood experiences and repeated trauma, um, I would, I may add, uh, would, would make it more difficult to recover from addiction and can in fact reinforce negative behaviors. Are there uh, socio, other socioeconomic uh, factors that you would like to illustrate uh, that that would influence the stress brain loop? Yeah, well, I think anything that, um, I think I, I mentioned if you don't have enough food or you don't have an, a clean supply of water, um, those are things that are going to, to impact that. And uh, so some, somebody who doesn't have those doesn't have the tools to um, to have good stress reduction um, techniques, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or manage the stress management. And they don't have the time. They, they're just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I think, mm -hmm. I don't know if that. Yeah, uh, and so maybe I'll, I'll just, uh, and this is a question maybe for everyone, is uh, we talk about access to resources and tools the role of human connection, the role of human connection uh, to address these issues. I'm not sure um, if others uh, uh, know of Jesse Thistle, Indigenous scholar and author, uh, wonderful um, author of From the Ashes. And he was speaking yesterday uh, and, and talked about, and he's also um, uh, acknowledged uh, an addict, uh, recovering addict. But the, the loss of human connection in his life was probably the biggest issue um, that triggered his addiction. Um, and so what factor now, particularly in this, what we could call almost a social society, uh, do you see a role there that we need to highlight for human connection and the importance of human connection? I, I, think, it's, I think it's huge. Um, but, you know, I just had a Zoom call with people that I haven't seen in 10 years because we could. And, and that was social connection. And that, that just made a world of difference. Uh, so I think technology is actually bringing people together, at least, with that social mm -hmm. connection. Now, obviously, screens, you can become addicted, all those sorts of things. But And I, I think it's really important when we're talking about the brain. Um, Rick Hansen is a, is a psychologist that talks about this a lot. And he talks about petting the lizard, so that older brain, petting the lizard, feeding the monkey, feed, sorry, feeding the mouse, so that's that mammalian brain, and then hugging the the monkey so mm -hmm. that social connection it's huge mm -hmm. it's so important mm -hmm. and that's that prefrontal cortex again i keep bringing it back to mm -hmm. that but that's what it is yeah so it's huge yeah yeah i mean i think dr gabor mate i think it was said the uh, the opposite of addiction is connection and 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 i think that that's you know it, it, it's it, it you know it's so important and i mean i can just you know, even uh, I have one of my one of my old childhood friends just just this year um, has been struggling or was struggling with uh, addiction and was uh, and had had, had uh, was in recovery, and COVID hit hard and uh, and drew him back into it. And because he had to procure his substances in the dangerous market, he overdosed and died just earlier on this year. So I mean, it has profound impacts and it's also make exacerbating in this COVID environment because people aren't able to connect as much, especially those people who are already marginalized and are already trying to uh, make those connections and it's those connections that allow them to, to stay in, in, in recovery. So I think mm -hmm. it's, 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 it, it, it's profound, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We framed the pandemic and the response to the pandemic for good reasons. So far, we framed it as first a medical problem, and second, 
uh, a public health problem, and then also how do we uh, mitigate uh, the effects of the various uh, measures that we've taken to try and protect ourselves. But lying just beneath the surface are all sorts of badly measured mental health effects that we will discover in the months and years to come. But for the moment, we, we sort of can see, but we don't actually have a good handle on yet. And that lack of social connection over an extended period of time will have effects. What's going to be extraordinary is the, is the ability of the healthcare system and other systems to cope with that is a big, mm -hmm. it's a big unknown. Mm -hmm. Now, it may mean that the salience of mental health will continue to rise as it has been for the last couple of decades. And that might mean we pay, pay it more attention. But the, 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 the magnitude of the problem that we're creating and that lack of social connection is badly measured for the moment. We don't have good data on it. And it will be a long time before we sort it through. Well, maybe that's where interdisciplinary research is so important so that we could bring in all of the, the data and the analysis um, together. And um, Matthew, a question for you. So uh, in your role, the, the community epidemiology workforce, it certainly plays a key role uh, in providing national data and evidence-based uh, responses to certainly address the societal impacts of addiction and substance abuse. Are there other key organizations and players or players that you would see could play a greater role or, or a role uh, to strengthen this national, provincial, municipal uh, community coordination of responses? Yeah, thank you. Uh, there's, been, there's, there's been a big, like I, I've been doing this work now for about 20 years and I've been working in the epidemiology space now for about 10. And it's, it's, it's amazing the change that's happened just in the last five years. Just uh, so, I mean, when I, when I first started working like probably seven, eight years ago in this space, um, I really had to kind of just check myself because I, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe that we didn't know how many people had died of, a, of, a, of an opioid overdose in Canada at that year. That year. And I, I, for a long time, that was, I, I thought it was just, I just didn't know the information. <laughs> so I spent a long time just looking for it. And, and, uh, and I realized, no, we don't. And it wasn't until, if you recall, I think it was Jane Philpott that kind of came out and yeah. just said after fentanyl had come out, we need to have good data on how many people are, are dying from opioid poisonings. And so now, you know, it's been really great. We were doing that work. So at the, at, earlier on, we released the first bulletin through the Canadian Community Epidemiology Network on Drug Use, Sendu, on the number of people who died as a result of fentanyl. Uh, or fentanyl toxicity, and it was soon after that 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 uh, that uh, that Minister Philpot made that statement, and the public health agency now does a lot of that work, and that's fantastic. Um, at the same time, too, the the Canadian Institutes for Health Information (CAI) High has stepped in and and was doing a little bit more work. Uh, health Canada. There's a lot of provincial uh, groups that are that are doing work. Um, so it, it it it's coming along, and the landscape for us and the the data landscape. Is, is, a, is an order of magnitude better than it was five years ago? Does it have a lot further to go? Uh, yes, it, it has a, a lot further to go to have timely information. Some of this, in, some of this is really just due to the fact that, um, that much, many of the databases we use to measure uh, substance use harms are, are kind of administrative databases held at the provincial level. And so because you know, and, and, and so trying to get them, trying to combine all this data becomes a data challenge because most provinces aren't, the, 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 the benefit to changing how they collect their data and losing their historical data trend is not really worth it to change it so that it can become nationally comparable yeah. because it's a provincial yeah. jurisdiction anyway. So some data is really, really hard to get. Like we don't really have a good sense of how many people are in treatment for substance use in Canada. We don't really have a good sense of, uh, of, of how many people, you know, access harm reduction centers across Canada. We don't have, there's a lot of things we don't have a really good uh, sense of at the, at, the, at the national level. We have a better sense of these at the provincial level and so more more better information can be collected at, at that level. Right, so certainly uh, creating greater access to that data, municipal, uh, regional, provincial, and federal, but also the question of how inter 
the interusability of that data as the systems are structured so differently. And I know this is an issue across many, uh, many sectors or on many, many issues. Uh, and I know that certainly from a, a research perspective, there's work being done and also with stats can uh, to see how can we address this issue, certainly in the context of open, open access, open data. Um, so on the topic of scientific evidence, and Patrick, you raised this already uh, earlier, but maybe you want to unpack that a little bit in terms of does government regulation of addictive substances uh, we really reflect that underlying scientific evidence? Uh, and if not, why not? Well, I think as should become clear by now, um, the policy mix that we have is based on a whole bunch of considerations of which science is but one. And that's as, as it should be. I mean, it's not like we, we live in a technocracy where uh, on a Monday, Andrak writes a paper that shows that something is really cool. On Tuesday, Matthew writes another paper that says, therefore we should do this. And on Wednesday, governments say, sure. Well, that's not how it works. <laughs> um, for really? lots of good reasons, not the least of which- Why not? <laughs> not the least of which, uh, to be in a, in a democracy, to be legitimate, the policy has to enjoy some support among the public. And so there is this process of public education, of public sensitization, where people come to understand the choices that governments make. Because absent that public support, uh, things can go, go off the rails. And we saw that with attempts to introduce harm reduction. The story of harm reduction in Canada is a very much one of push and pull, stop and start, as governments worked really hard to try and bring the communities defined in different ways along with them. So at the beginning, for example, police forces were very suspicious of harm reduction initiatives and eventually in most places came around to being strong supporters of harm reduction. So it takes, it takes some time. But in order for governments to pursue these things, they have to have a sense that they can bring the public with them, but it's not an, so it's not an easy process, mm -hmm. partly because it's just so paradoxical, right? If you tell me that opioids and chocolate cake are both addictive, at some level that's true, but boy, it, it's, 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 it's counterintuitive. And so we have a job to do to make people come to understand, but also to think about what biases and uh, assumptions they make. So because mm -hmm. there's a huge, if you will, philosophical or moral overlay uh, to, to substance use and addiction. And as long as we use that kind of frame, it's going to get in the way of making the kind of policy changes that we would want. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is a question for, for everyone. Uh, I'm thinking, I can't recall if it was um, Andrew or Matthew that raised the issue of disruptions. Uh, and one could say that COVID-19 uh, is a disruption on on unprecedented scale. Uh, we have disruptions in personal lives, we have factors at play, but what impact these disruptions can have or any reflections that you want to share in terms of what would be some of the positive impacts of a disruption and uh, what, what disruption, give us an example of a disruption that you think would really make a, a change for some of the things that we're talking about in terms of collective approaches. I can think of one, and it may be a bit not what you're expecting, but um, uh, so let me take, see if I can make this, how I can make this concrete. Um, we have examples where um, a country like Canada, because of its perception of itself, is strongly in favor of global global cooperation and respecting of international norms and uh, being part of global solutions. So at least theoretically, because it'll it would be a while coming, but you could imagine a world in which um, there was a uh, a move in other countries uh, to change the fundamentally the way we think about addictive substances. So let me be more precise. Reflecting logics from 20 and 30 years ago, we have a series of treaties around the world that uh, seek to control illegal substances of which cannabis is one. And strictly speaking, Canada is in violation of its treaty obligations around because of the way we treat cannabis. Um, you, 
that is a huge break on change. So the, if we wish to adopt these policies, innovative policies, one of our challenges is what do we think about those international rules? But you could imagine a world in which once those international rules change, you could have a, sort of a, an accelerating effect. And we see some of that on, on harm reduction, particularly on opioids, that the world has changed dramatically in 15 years on harm reduction, uh, led by Western European countries, so that it, now it's almost, I won't say become normalized, but it's much more common. And then very slowly the law will catch up and then it'll make a huge difference if you want to move forward. If you know, no, you no longer have this break about, you know, what, what are our, what are other countries think? But the best example of that is the United States. In the United States at the local level, cannabis is, is often legal in certain states, but the federal government continues to make it illegal. That's a huge break, but at some point it's going to flip. And when that happens, all sorts of interesting things can will, will flow from that. So the disruption sometimes comes from places where you least expect it. Come, come, come could be your biggest trading partner. Come, can happen because of a treaty, a treaty change, and that creates opportunity, whether it gets used or not. Is another mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. Matthew, Andrew, anything you'd like to add in that context of disruptions? I mean, we have we have put a much greater effort uh, as a result of of, of uh, COVID-19 to providing people a minimum amount of, 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 uh, of, of funds with which to live um, through, uh, through the CERB. Uh, we have put, there have been programs in different areas of the country that have tried to uh, provide shelter for the homeless in innovative ways. Um, so I think there are little like pockets of little innovations that have gone on that seem to be before intractable problems. And now they kind of just, they, 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 because we have to, uh, we, can, we can move forward with them. There is move with the federal government to uh, provide greater a number of licenses to, for, to allow people to be prescribed opioids who may, uh, who may be, have an opioid dependency. So I think that they're, I don't know if they're, they're large scale at the national level, uh, mm -hmm. but, but I, you, there are kind of, the, there are the little disruptions uh, locally, around the uh, the country, to, uh, have they've done? There's been some interesting things that have been done. It will be interesting to see to follow mm -hmm. them up. So uh, maybe a, a final question for all three of our panelists, if you'd like to weigh in on this. Uh, and again, uh, we have a few more minutes uh, to invite any questions from our participants uh, who are listening in. If you'd like to pose that question uh, in English, ou soit en français. Uh, and I think it was Matthew, um, you, in your presentation, um, you talked about uh, access to resources and tools as one of a key response to, to addressing substance abuse. Uh, and are there certain strategies that you would recommend or others would recommend uh, to be adopted to, great, to enable that greater access uh, to resources? And if you'd also like to venture even a further to say in your, from your perspective, is there is there, is there a prioritization that we need to think about uh, in terms of sectors of society, uh, be it across academic, government, community, uh, business sectors that we really need to introduce or further enable some of those strategies to advance addressing addiction? So maybe, uh, you know, the first, the first response that comes to mind really comes down to uh, stigma and the stigma associated with substance use and addiction. And I mean, we talked earlier on about mental health. And I mean, if you think about mental health, like, so I, re I mean, I can remember growing up uh, as a young kid in New Brunswick and talking about uh, the, the, the person down the street who had a nervous breakdown. I mean, we, we you know, if you remember that term, uh, it, it certainly doesn't sound good, and it certainly sounds like they somehow failed. I mean, really, what this person did is they they had they, had, they went through a mental health crisis, and 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 that, so that's kind of stigmatizing. We still have a, a very large amount of stigma that is associated with uh, substance use and addiction, and this impacts individuals who are interested in accessing healthcare services from primary healthcare physicians. It, it influences their ability to access treatment for mental health, which they may be using substances to, to try and self-medicate for their mental health. 
uh, it influences their ability to 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 buy groceries at the grocery store. So I mean, I it, it, it's really so. I think you know when we say tools and services, I mean probably one of the biggest things would be tr to try and change uh, change how we see people who have substance use addictions, because I think that they are going to uh, that will help them to be able to access services better than uh, before. I mean. I like I was saying earlier about just talking about my friend. I mean, uh, that who who died earlier on from a, a, a drug poisoning. I mean, he his family uh, said it was a heart attack. He he right. didn't access yeah. treatment, and right. and when I did have dinner with him at one point, he asked me not to tell anybody. So I mean, it even though we I think when we talk amongst ourselves, kind of a slightly more educated population, maybe, you know, we, we kind of understand that, that, you know, this is more of a health issue. But really, when you look, when you start talking about the population at large, uh, substance use is still uh, something to be ashamed of. It's, it's a shameful, it's a lack of willpower, it's a lack of control. And when you get into interfacing with, uh, with service providers, that comes through loud and clear. They don't, you, it, it, people are not able to access the same services uh -huh, uh, or uh -huh. the same quality of services. And sometimes uh -huh. even there's a criteria put on that you have to stop using before you get the service. So uh -huh. I think that would be my best answer to your question. We do have a few questions in our Q&A, uh, which for some reason I was not able to see earlier. So apologies there, but um, I've, uh, a few have been shared. Anything to add on, on my question or I can jump right to the questions from our participants. We've got about 10 minutes left. So Patrick mentioned that uh, harm reduction efforts often meet opposition locally. Can you give some examples of success stories and some specifics of how the local opposition was addressed? Um, well, there are several success stories across Canada, um, but it's no, by no means a straightforward process. The one I'm most familiar with, which a number of people here, here this afternoon will know, is that of Insight in Vancouver, which was the first uh, harm reduction site in Canada. And I guess what were the ingredients? Well, uh, there's a, bit, a fair bit of research on this, um, some of which I've done. One of the key ingredients was obviously leadership, um, often at the local level. So we, we know in healthcare generally, that some of the most important innovation happens at the local level and percolates its way upwards. And so the uh, Medical Officer of Health in Vancouver, the Provincial uh, Health Officer, in fact, went to the point of declaring a public health emergency uh, around these issues. So these have the effects of drawing attention to things. The other ingredient in, in that particular case was uh, leadership, in this case from the Government of Canada, which was willing and able to find its way clear only after it went to the Supreme Court, but anyway, to change the legal regime, which allowed for more experimentation. Since then, what do we observe? Well, we observe that the implementation of harm reduction issues is very uneven from, from province to province. Uh, some provinces, you know, two steps forward, one step back. Uh, and I think the answer there is that we still have a long way to go for the general public to understand the, the very nature of addiction and get beyond some of the social stigma that exists because right. politicians necessarily are sensitive to that kind of thing. Uh, so it's some combination of leadership plus, um, plus uh, a public awareness. But one thing is for sure, it's not simply a matter of just piling up more scientific evidence. Because uh, right. on harm reduction in particular, at least for opioids, that, that's been done. So it's not a matter of more studies, it's a matter of how we use that data and how we prepare the ground to make the change that we want. Mm -hmm. And maybe here human connection also plays a role because fostering relationships uh, and respect for different uh, knowledge systems, uh, different evidence from multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary uh, sources is really, really key. But uh, policy making uh, by just sharing a study um, is not necessarily going to be the most effective ways. Uh, so we have about five minutes uh, and again maybe uh, if there's additional questions which unfortunately um, I'm not I can't see but if there's anything else that anyone would like to share uh, maybe just share it with um, with in the Q&A's it'll be forwarded to me 
we have about five minutes. So maybe I will give uh, each of our panelists maybe a, a minute or two just to share their final reflections on what they see as being critical for all of us to know in the context of addressing addiction and substance abuse. Andrea? Well, I wasn't expecting that. But. I know. <laughs> Thanks like a lot. You on, I just had <laughs> some stress. You've got to use your <laughs> right side My of your prefrontal brain. cortex. Has the my mindfulness cortex. training going to kick in? So uh, throughout this, I, I'm an idealist. I believe in prevention. I believe in teaching youth about their brains and about the fact that they have control over their brains. And I think that you weren't able to see a question that I think is really an important question and it's about access. Uh, it's, clinical, it's a clinical psychologist that is asking the question about healthcare professionals and, and that there's not really sort of addiction specialists out there. And that I think people do fall by the wayside because they're, because there, there's, there's not, um, substance use sort of falls between um, mental health and physical health, despite the fact that they should be one. And so I think that's a problem mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. I guess we didn't have time to to discuss, but I think is a really important question mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that um, that was in the q and I guess you don't have access to that. But I think that this was this was a, a good opportunity to see all aspects of it. Like I don't yeah. think about policy like Patrick does, and my eyes were opened to to this. I think, you know, I think it's pretty straight cut because it's about neuroscience <laughs> and and obviously that's not the case and so it's really important to bring people experts together like this to uh, to have a platform yeah to absolutely discuss. absolutely and it is a very complex issue and, and we're seeing the questions and the comments uh now that are being shared with me and and in, in some ways you know we're studying the paradigm still of medical models uh, and then how do we ensure that the approaches, new approaches really take into account the holistic uh, and the implications on policy and understand how policy is developed. Uh, Patrick, Matthew, maybe we'll begin with Patrick because your microphone is on. Sure, okay, two quick comments. First, um, on addiction to illegal substances, there are uh, some dramatic changes that are just off to the wings. So here in Canada, the Medical Officer of Health for Vancouver and Dr. Davila, the Medical Officer of Health for Toronto have come out quite strongly calling for the decriminalization of a lot of illegal substances and the adoption of a different frame where we would think of think of them as simply an addictive substance that needed to be that needs to be treated in a very particular way with an emphasis on treatment rather than criminal justice. Uh, it's these are two voices among many, and it's not clear where it will go. But there are countries like Portugal that have uh, legalized a bunch of heretofore illegal drugs mm -hmm. across the board. Um, so so th there is a change agenda just off to one side if we care to look, although I don't want to I don't want to underestimate how hard that would be. But maybe the more important point to end on a positive note is um, my students uh, are amazingly transparent and open about their mental health and the mental health of their of their colleagues and I think are I, at least I'm I want to believe are more knowledgeable about mental health issues generally than I was at their age and I think this will have positive effects over time I think it will mean that stigma declines over time but it will also mean that the salience of some of the issues we've been talking about will rise and I mean, by no means a perfect system but eventually politicians will and governments will be forced to, to pay more attention. But the other thing about my students is they don't particularly have any patience for the existing categories. Medical, mm. not medical, psychology, mental health, physical health, criminal justice, it's all, it's all a, they're, they're comfortable with complexity. And so where so much of what we do is a function of the structures we've built, my students are very impatient with those structures. And if we can break down some of these silos and some of these barriers, serious change could happen. Okay, wonderful. 
a final comment maybe for Matthew and then I'll uh, invite Hella to Sina to give closing remarks. Well, maybe I'll just uh, echo what Patrick just said there. I mean, in my in my length of time working in this field for 20 years, the, the change has been like astounding. So, I mean, we, uh, you know, we, 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 even just within the last 10 years, we've moved from seeing substance uh, dependency as primarily a, a, a public safety issue to a, a health issue. And that's, that's huge. And it's, and it's massive. So, I, and we are on the right trajectory. So I think that we, you know, if we continue going that direction, I think it will be really, uh, it's a positive one to go on. And then finally, I think that one of the things that I don't want in the audience to go away with is to think that, uh, you know, kind of uh, chocolate cake is the same as cocaine and, and all of these things are the same. I mean, we do know that some, like, and one, one of the ways that we can quantify it a little bit is looking at the, at the, at the, at the proportion of people who can you who use a substance who may not be dependent on that substance, or the number of individuals or the frequency of use uh, among a, a small portion of them, and we do we do know that 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 more people that there are a great deal of individuals who use alcohol and who do so within a low risk limits. We know that's about cannabis as well. It's not as it's it's partially true with cocaine. There are some people who use cocaine and don't become addicted as you move towards opioids and some of the other drugs, this it becomes more. So it's not, it's, they're not all created equal. So maybe that's another, yeah, uh -huh. you know, like even though it's been coming, even though the, a large part of the, of, uh, the discussion has really been about moving towards kind of more of a an inclusive model where substances are, 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 are looked at more equivalently, there, it, there, are, there are, they are different. They hit the brain differently and they, there are differences there, so yeah. Thank, thank you, you so much, Andrea, Patrick, Matthew. Thank you so much for an excellent discussion. And again, uh, so many, we could have gone on for another hour, I'm sure. Thank you, Patrick, for um, mentioning the Portuguese experiment because that was one comment and you made a brief reference to that. So I'll in, uh, introduce Hela or invite Hela to Sina, the former president of the Royal Canadian Institute for Science to give us a few closing remarks. Great, thanks very much, Ursula. So since 1849, actually, the Royal Canadian Institute for Science has been bringing scientists out of their labs to speak to the public. And Sir Sanford Fleming started this idea with three other scientists thinking that Canada is better if its citizens understood science and the impact on their lives. So he created a forum. Everybody got together face to face in real life and uh, to talk about their different disciplines. So here we are in uh, 2020. We're still doing this, but we do it better together with partners. So it's uh, as the last words on this panel. It gives me great pleasure to thank, first of all, Ursula, our moderator. So it's already an art to be able to uh, manage a panel live and to keep a conversation going as you've done today. So we want to uh, thank you for bringing your own insight to this, for being able to keep this virtual conversation going with uh, the panelists. And the whole thing was, I think, brought to life, was informative and thought provoking and uh, makes us all consider the different aspects of this very uh, topical and difficult uh, topic. So thank you very much, Ursula, for taking time out of your day to uh, moderate our panel. Secondly, a uh, big thank you to our panelists, uh, Dr. Andra Smith, Dr. Matthew Young, and Dr. Patrick Fafard. And you gave us today your most valuable resource, your time. I know how long it takes to actually get your head around something that you've got to uh, talk about your research in eight minutes or seven minutes and then keep this conversation going to an audience that you can't even see. <laughs> so it's a very, it's a, it's a difficult thing to do. And so we want to thank you for doing that, for speaking with such passion about your science, Andra, for the challenges uh, in policy, Patrick, and for the impacts on society. And there was a really nice blending and intersection of all three, which makes these panels really topical, I think and really brings the uh, link to science, to society and policy together. And lastly, Monica, thank you for being our partner. 
for working together with us. And we all know that the devil's in the details. So I'm thanking uh, Raphael, who's sitting behind the ISSP logo there, and uh, our executive director, Kirsten, without which uh, this hasn't happened. The virtual world has uh, challenged us in many different ways. And uh, I know it's all the little doodads in the background that makes this all happen. And thanks to our audience who joined us this afternoon. So watch the RCI science site and the ISSP site. We both have individual different topics going on all at the same time as well. And then as Monica said in the very beginning, we come together to talk about uh, the intersection of science, society and policy. And we'll be having another excellent discussion in the fall. So watch our websites. Thank you to all of you both here who I can see and the people that are out there that I can't for joining us this afternoon. Awesome job, thank you.